Surviving Bob Jones University of Christian Cults is a thought-provoking podcast series that delves deeply into the history of Bob Jones University, the psychology of fundamentalism, the criteria for cults, and survivors' experiences. BJU is a controversial religious institution, and this podcast sheds light on the experiences of those who have survived this high-control environment. Please subscribe to stay updated on the premiere of this podcast, which is coming in 2023. everyone and welcome to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist. Before I go any further though, I want to just say hello to my co-host Troy Waller. How are you Troy? I'm very well, thank you Pastor Brian. I'm very well. Fucking hell, you got to stop calling me Pastor Brian. It's really... it's But it, but it suits you, you're so good with people. <laughs> I am, I am because I'm a sociopath. That's probably why. <laughs> That's probably what it is. I know. I'm not a narcissist. I have a podcast. Anyway. <laughs> oh, I love it. But, but Troy, today, I know I say this all the time. You do say it all the time and you're going to say it now. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to do a big Kev. I'm excited because the person we have on today is someone who I have followed their career throughout the years from when he was that movie guy on Triple J and he was also... Hungry Beast, lots and lots of great shows, which our friend Anthony Van Brown, I think, was on Hungry Beast at one stage. But it's Mark Fennell, and Mark Fennell is also an Australian journalist. He's a TV presenter, radio personality, and an author. And he's the host currently of Mastermind in Australia, which, Mark, my mum watches. Yes. She makes me watch it with her, and then she goes, you should go on Mastermind. That's how my family knows Mark Fennell, by the way, and that's a true story. Yeah, because we're waiting for the SBS news because we're a very global family. But another great thing that you've you've done besides being the co-anchor of the feed is stuff the British stole. I think that's been awesome and it's a really educative and incredibly interesting stuff. So, Mark, welcome to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist. Thank you. It, I have to say, of any podcast I've ever been on, this is still the best title by by a significant margin. Well, I I have to give kudos to Troy for his creative genius. He was the one that it was, I think, on the day that we were recording the first episode, he goes, hey, I'm thinking we should call this I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist because, you know, remember, I was a teenage werewolf, I was a whatever. (laughs) And so kudos to you, Troy. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hey, so Mark, you are hosting a new documentary, which is now out on SBS On Demand called The Kingdom, which is about Pentecostalism. And when we heard that, we thought, Pentecostalism, that rings a bell. Let's see if we can get him on our show. So welcome. It's lovely to be here. Uh, And I, I feel like it's been a long time coming. It has. Look, we have been stalking you and hassling you for a while. Um, When we had Tom Tilly on the show, I said to Tom, hey, I'd love to get Mark on. What do you reckon? He goes, oh, here's Mark's email. Give him a crack. And I thought, oh, that's it. Mark's not going to come on. We didn't hear from you. But when we saw this come out, I thought he's obviously been very, very busy. And then you graciously got back to us and here we are. So I think there's going to be some great conversation today because we were very fortunate. We, We feel like we're in the media when we got early access to the doco and we watched it. And, and I guess technically we are in the media. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, judging by the cameras and the microphones, you, my friends, are media now. That's what Tom Tilly said to us. Remember when I was asking him about the size of the Revival Centre uh, denomination and he said, well, you're media now. Why don't you go to the stats and ask them for, for media access? And I was just like, ooh, and I felt all excited. It was like, wow, a real journalist just said that I'm a journalist. I was all thrilled. Hmm. <laughs> no, it was it was lots of fun, but we are going to dive into the the doco shortly. But we've got to really establish your cred first, Mark. <laughs> so the first question is: Were you a teenage fundamentalist? I've been thinking about this question for a while now, and I think my answer is: If I was, I wasn't very good at it, and that's probably why I'm here today. <laughs> if that makes sense. So my background is. 
my mum came from Singapore to, uh, to Australia and she, uh, she was converted, her family, whole family of Hindus, and they converted over in, um, in Singapore. And so she, mum was evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal, choose your own adventure on that title, uh, pretty much from the day I was born. But we as kids, we grew up, I think initially we went to what was then called CLC, the church that obviously eventually became Hillsong. And then we bounced for like a whole bunch of different Pentecostal, charismatic, evangelical, I'm just going to do them interchangeably now, uh, churches all around Sydney. And then eventually I kind of spun off and went off to my own one uh, when I was a teenager. So I was in it pretty much my entire childhood up until sort of my early twenties. And then I sort of did what I didn't realize at the time was quiet quitting. Like I think I quiet quit Christianity. Uh, and I kind of, you know, say for one or two interviews or articles or things like that over the years, I've kind of never really mentioned it. And so we set up a, a documentary unit at SBS and at the end of uh, midway through last year, and the idea came up like, why don't we look into the world of Pentecostal Christianity? And we started sort of a fishing expedition. And then I realized halfway through that process, I had this photo that I didn't realize existed. And it's the photo that you can see in, the, in like the trailer and it's in the, like pretty much the first shot of the film, which is me as a very precocious, I would have been five-year-old on the, you know, the stage of CLC of what would eventually become Hillsong, fully like, like hanging with Mr. Cooper pose, like mugging for the camera. And right behind me is Frank Houston. <laughs> and it's the dedication of my brother. And I looked at that and went, okay, right. And I think that was kind of the, I guess, inflection point for like, oh, maybe I am the right person to tell these kinds of stories. And so it was a real, we weren't sure how much of me would be in the film, but it really became, it, it started off as a question of like, well, where is the Pentecostal Christianity world today and what is, and what is becoming of it? Uh, and then as that process continued, it became like, okay, well, who are you in all this? Because I've got a whole team of people who, well, not a whole team of people, like there's six of us, right? But they, none of them have any church background. And they all looked at me and went, and we started shooting these interviews and they're like, why is Mark being so weird? Like, why does Mark look like he's reliving his childhood? And I was like, and suddenly it occurred to them that they had no idea about my childhood. So I had to like sit down and explain it. I had to do like Pentecostal 101 with a team of grown adults. And it was very funny to watch their faces throughout. We are not in air quotes, the mainstream audience, right? So you, you, you can say Hillsong, yeah. you can say Pentecostal <laughs> in, in your documentary, but for us, we want to hear what churches did you go to? What denominations? So we can start off with Hills CLC and yeah. then where did you end up next? Uh, I think there was one in Burwood and so I'm from Sydney. So in, in Australia, so I, one called, I think it was Glorious Gospel. There was a, something called City Church that eventually got subsumed into C3, I think, but that happened afterwards. Then there was a vineyard, a vineyard church, which was uh, down south. And I think after that, I sort of sporadically went to what I, it's funny because I forgot what it was called, but I suspect it ended up becoming Scott Morrison's church, Horizon, in the Shire. And that, I think, was the beginning of the end for me <laughs> because oh, at that point I was already kind of, something's not right, this isn't working for me. So I kind of, that was my broad, like there might've been a few others in the mix because it's a long childhood, but those were sort of the main ones that I remember. So when you say something wasn't right, something wasn't working for you, what, what's that mean? Uh, well, there's a few things. I think this is actually one of the reasons why I wanted to, what, one of the things that kind of came out of making the documentary because I kind of just left and I literally stopped talking to people. like. I joked that it was quite quitting, but it kind of was. I just abandoned it. And then I didn't really talk about it and I didn't really process it, say for, you know, a few mentions here and there. And one of the interesting things that came out of making the film is me actually having to sit down and explain to other people why. Because I think my exit from the world of Christianity would have been a lot easier to explain if something catastrophic had happened. And, I, and I've realised now actually... The more I, now that the you know the film's out and the trailer's out and people want to talk about, it, I'm realizing it's now more common than I think I thought it was because I think a lot of people will talk about exit the church after something disastrous happens, and those stories are important, obviously, like they're really important. But for me, I think my feelings on it are complicated, as you can tell, because on the one hand, particularly in my teenage years, that community, particularly like those smaller suburban churches, like really active youth groups filled with teenagers absolutely saved my life. Like no question. It was a community when I, my parents' marriage were falling apart. Like it was, and I just sort of got absorbed into this world. It was awesome. The people were awesome. 
but there came a moment where I realized I was kind of faking it. You can get away with it for a while, but I remember having this, normally these things happen gradually. This is, this was a real like turning point moment. I remember I would have been standing in one of those, one of the bigger churches, it must've been down in the Shire. And I remember everyone it's, you know, towards the end, it's sort of altar call territory, right? So, you know, the bit at the end of the sermon where the, the music starts swelling, which is totally organic and not a planned thing at all. You mean the manipulative bit at the end? <laughs> yeah. Right. Sidebar, one of the most fun things about doing this with a team of people that have no experience of church is me just sitting there going, all right, here's how it works. You start off with your three big songs, your, your three sad songs. You announce all the prayers that were answered this week. Then you ask for money. Then the, sp the speaker comes up and they're the best speaker ever. And then you can always tell when it's coming to an end because the music starts playing. And that when we went in and, and filmed one of them, you could see on the, the team's face, they're like, Ah, oh, I see it. I'm like, yes. And there's a person in the film, Dave, who uh, he's like, it's all curated within a minute of it. And I actually, it's funny when he said that, I was like, oh my God, it totally is, isn't it? Like, that's how kind of indoctrinated I was. I was like, it never occurred to me that this was somehow a planned structured thing. Anyway, I digress. Hold on a bit. But uh, first, Mark, before you go on, because I'm a stats man, of your group of six, how many responded to the altar call? Oh, none of them. Oh, they were good. There to work. Okay, <laughs> so it's a zero work. strike rate. I just, I no, just zero, want to make no. sure. No, I mean, in <laughs> fairness, though, so we, in the end, I ended up only going going to two of those services because I was kind of avoiding them, which I talk about in the film. I was like really avoiding going to the services. I went to one in America that we didn't have cameras in there. I just when I I was over filming in America towards the end of last year, and I was in Arizona. And I was going, we had booked an interview with uh, an ex Hillsong person and she, uh, and as, and I, as a sort of, as a matter of course, I went to go visit what used to be Hillsong, Arizona, what is now called out city of grace. And we'd been sort of emailing uh, the, the people there just to kind of see if they would talk. And just, I thought it was r right to do. And what I really didn't want to do, I didn't want to do it on camera. So, and we didn't have cameras, they were all permission to film. So I, I sort of just rocked up on a Sunday. Uh, at the time, I was really annoyed because I was like, why am I doing this? It's not going to be useful. We can't film it. But I'm actually kind of really glad I'm, I'm here in a country where nobody knows who I am. Nobody knows what I'm here for. I'm just a random Australian rocking up to a random church in Arizona by myself with no explanation, no questions asked. It was almost like there was safety and anonymity. And I'm glad it was that because it, as soon as I walked through the door, I realized how difficult it was for me to be there. So I rocked up at the front door and I was like, hi, I'm in town. I just came for a visit. And as soon as I heard my accent, they were really like, oh, you're Australian. You may have heard we used to be a, a hell song. I was like, okay, so you guys are right in there with that. And they were like, this is the thing. They were lovely. Like I, and I'm at pains to point this out to everybody. They were so lovely, like so lovely. What isn't obvious is that they'd taken this, beautiful old kind of Mexican Baptist church looking thing. And they'd converted that into a mega church. And it was actually, you know how all mega churches on the inside kind of look like the same thing, right? They're just like they're big black boxes with nice lighting setups. And they'd actually done something really like, this is how lame I am, architecturally interesting. And they'd taken an old church and they'd made it Penty, right? And I walked in and I like, I sat and they still had, they had pews. That was the other thing. I was like, this is, this is interesting. They had pews, right? And so I went in and I, I sat in the back row and I, and I was like, I took note of the exits. That's how like fight or flight my response was. And uh, I sat there and I sat through the whole thing. And I remember I, I have a hard rule that I've instigated for myself, which is um, because I left because I felt like I was a fraud. I will not stand up. Right. It's just, I, I, I will not perform. I will not be the performing monkey. I will not fake it. So I just sat there in the corner uh, and then the same thing happened in Perth when, when we, which is the scene that's in the film and it happened all over again without planning it. That's the same thing. I just, I will not perform. I will not fake it. Faking it is how I got myself into the mess in the first place. So I sat there and I just watched the whole thing unfold and it was, I'm glad it happened quietly by myself and not part of the film because I was just like, oh, I remembered all the reasons why I don't do this anymore. And it's been 17 something in that vicinity right and I, I also hadn't clocked how long it had been I've totally digressed because the story I was going to tell you is, is when I decided to leave and it was uh, I would have been 21 22 
and I was at one of the churches down in down south. And I remember when everyone's doing the altar call moment and everyone's hands are up in the air and everyone's eyes closed, I just opened my mind and I just looked around and I realized clear as day is like, they're all feeling something and I'm very much not. And this whole thing is built on feeling. And if you're not feeling it, what's the point? Like really like, what's the point? And I was like, I just don't think I can waste another minute of my life doing this. Like, and I say that without any judgment for people for whom it does work. Like, I'm just like, I think this is, this is one of the difficulties of talking about this. It's like, on the one hand, it's like, I would like us to have a sensible conversation where we can talk about what does and doesn't work in this world whilst not necessarily attacking people's faith. And I, that was the trick of the film. I was trying to work out if there was a way I could do this thing where I was not attacking people's beliefs, but I was but we were kind of trying to articulate things about this universe that were clearly not great. And how do we do both of these things at the same time? And is there a sensible way of doing it? When I was watching your film and you were sitting in the church in Perth, yeah. I was triggering along with you. Oh, I could sorry. see your face. No, it's okay, man. I, I, I was resonating in a, in, in a positive way in one sense, but I – could see your face and I could see what was going on and I was thinking, I don't think I could do it. We've talked about going up back to our old church and like doing an episode and then when we come back and, you know, talk about having gone, I don't think I could do it. I really don't. But I have one of these tragedy stories, right, whereas mm. Brian doesn't so much. Right. But I could really feel your pain and I think when when our audience watches this film, which they will, they're going to say, there it is. I know how he feels. I get the impression that's going to be quite a common reaction. I think what it exposes is you bring your baggage into the room, right? And somehow the nature of that, and maybe maybe it exposes something about, I guess I, I'm going to say, I'm going to be generous and say how emotionally effective those environments are at making you, driving you to a place of emotion. Let's put it that way, right? Like I'm being I'm being very diplomatic with how I frame that. So whatever issues you brought into the room are going to be, uh, you know, with the big swelling music and they're going to, it's going to find a moment to be expressed. I think the challenge, oh, challenge is probably not the right. I think the struggle for me is I, I sort of sat there and I was like, how do I explain this to people? Because I was on the one hand, on the one hand, I was like, how do I explain this to people who have no concept of churching how do I explain to people that are in there and love it and can't for a million years understand why you wouldn't be swept away in this motion? And, and then how do I explain it in a way that both of them will listen? And I don't know that I've pulled it off. I, I don't know, but I'm like, and, and also how do I explain it without getting too mired in my own bullshit? Because there's a lot of like my life in there. And I, and I, I am not used to making my life the story. Uh, like, confusingly, for a person who talks for a living, I'm not used to making myself the story. It's not a thing I do generally. Even with this, that was not the original plan. And it eventually, the only way I became part of the the film really is because it, it, the, the starting position was, oh, you were in the world and you're outside of the world. You probably can act as a good intermediary. So we knew there was that background. But then when we started doing interviews, Elise, the writer and, and produce, uh, the producer and director, she was like, Mark looks uncomfortable <laughs> why is he like why is he having these weird reactions in interviews to people and there came a point where a group of people who've known me for you know close to 10 years they kind of knew this was there They're like at some point we just need to sit you down and just get you to blurt out your life story and so I was away filming for a month I came back to Australia and the day before Christmas we shot there's an interview with me that kind of runs throughout the film and initially we weren't sure we were, it was even going to be in the film. And they were like, should we wait until the new year? And I'm like, no, I'm the right amount of burnt out. If you want me to be honest with you, do it now or we're never doing it. And so they sat me down the day before Christmas and I was like, and like <laughs> two producers and a camo sort of sat in front of me with three cameras. And I was like, have at me, ask me anything. This is the AMA of, of my Christianity. And they just blurted out. Every, and I just blurted out my childhood, my parents, their marriage, like everything. And then at the end of them, I said, when we decide what to put in this film, that's great. But the full interview never goes in the SBS archive system. It never gets kept. No one can ever see it beyond what we decide to put in the film. That's the deal. And they seem to get that. 
It's interesting you say that because one of the things that I saw in the trailer, which wasn't in the actual film, is you sitting there and then you put your hands up and you go, jazz hands. <laughs> and it was just this moment where it's just like you're just going, oh, fuck. You know, you could just see it. And so to be honest, you know, remembering our podcast, right, I was a teenage fundamentalist all about this experience and we do a lot of interviews and that was my favourite part of the doco, (laughs) my friend, truly. Just watching you go, I am dealing with this, this is killing me, this is hurting me and yet at the same time, the other thing that freaked me out, not freaked me out but spun me out was how nice you were to the youth pastors that you're interviewing and the pastors you're interviewing. And I thought, oh man, he's just such a professional because I probably would have been sitting there just giving them the evil eye. So you did so well. Oh, look, there's two things with that. I like people. Like I'm maybe to my own detriment, but I genuinely like people and I want them, those individual people that who are still in the church world, as far as I know, they've done nothing wrong as far as I can tell, right? So I don't have any reason to be anything other than pleasant to them because I want them to feel like I will listen and I do listen and I want to listen. I think the trick for me, yeah, look, I'm an accidental journalist, like to be honest with you. Like I, as you mentioned before, I, I came into, I was a film critic for many years and I ended up starting to interview people and then you know, ended up making documentaries and podcasts and awards and all that kind of gear. And it was lovely, but I'm, I don't arrive at journalism through this like newsroom lens of like, what's the hook? What's the angle? I, I'm I'm very into story and structure and how to make um and hold people's attention. And I have like very strong views on that, but I'm, there's a particular kind of journo mindset that I don't possess or we want to possess. And I think it works reasonably well for me. And one of those is that I don't do bullshit gotcha questions unless I, I will do smiling assassin like I'll do like sit there smile and just ask you and sit there silently until people answer I'll do that but I don't do the heavy <laughs> I don't know what how to describe it. like I don't do the I'm a journalist and this is an important story I, that's not me uh somebody else can do it and that's great and I'm, I'm more powerful than but it's not what I do um what I like to do is create a space where people feel like they're being heard and then curate a range of opinions within that uh and in the end they all feel like they were heard, but they all feel like it gave, we gave too much time to the person that disagrees with them. That is a consistent theme. And that's fine. And I think that comes across really clear in the doco. Like you come in with a very respectful style. You come in with a welcoming and, and one that creates trust and safety for people. But I think you're also coming from a bit of a nostalgic lens, potentially, with church, because it was a few of the things you could see, the discomfort, absolutely. I could see how incredibly uncomfortable you were. You talked about your discomfort about sharing your story and how maybe it's the vulnerability that that brings. And maybe jazz it's, hands. Jazz, jazz hands. hands. But, and, but maybe it's also the shame. I mean, I... I was a hopeless Christian in that I could not witness or evangelize to people unless I was drunk because I just. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name you should have gone with for the podcast. Should have. I was a drunk teenager. Yeah. I but... can't proselytize unless I'm drunk. <laughs> well, there it is. Here's Go the spin off. The <laughs> spin off is happening. But it was because I just didn't have the, the confidence that what I believed was actually legit. But I loved the church. I loved the community. Mm. I loved the safety it gave me. And to a degree, I share your view that in many ways it saved me. I was a pretty messed up teenager and it gave me some stability. It gave me a bit of a roadmap on this is how a community or a healthy family can actually wrap around you and give you some guidance, even if it's not perfect, even if it's something that in the end you're going to actually jettison it, it created that for me. So how was that feeling of nostalgia? Was that something that was palpable? Was it something you were aware of? And did you feel slightly guilty that you were also doing this doco, which looked at the other side of it, which possibly wasn't as positive? Um, Not guilty. Nostalgia was definitely... Nostalgia is like a an inherently positively tinged word. And I'm not sure that I had positively tinged feelings about it, if you know what I mean. I think, look, there's a few things with that. Whenever you fold a bit of yourself into one of these things, you've always got to be really mindful of 
I guess, almost like pulling focus. And I think the issue for me is that there are people in that film and people that aren't in the film that have had significant traumatizing, really serious issues in, uh, in various churches. And I don't ever want anything I say or do my sort of weird middling experience of not feeling God. I don't want that to overshadow their experience. Now, I think to some extent it, it kind of does in this film because of the, the, the weighting of me in it. But I do think that it's a, always a bit of an art to work out how you balance those things. Um, I'm kind of, in a sense, an audience doorway. So I'm naturally going to take up a little bit of the, the space there. But I think what was important to me was to make sure that, I guess, to make sure that there was a cross-section of experiences. And I think in within, within that, it was also a cross-section of outcomes as well, right? So, you know, Elise Pataka, who who was the writer and director of it, she spent a lot, like she and I went off to meet, you know, every every pastor we could get in front of us. And then, and then but she also did a lot of this heavy lifting of just talking to, to victims and people, you know, who were just not ready to talk right? Just, we're just not ready to talk. And that on, you know, as a filmmakers, as for filmmakers, it's on one level, it's frustrating, but as humans, you're like, yeah, I get it. You know, I do. And I think what was important for me is at the end, you know, you have people that straight up left, you have some people that actually, they look at their faith journey for lack of a better term, and it's rubble and they have to pick out the bits that they think are worth keeping. There's a a particular woman in there, um, Sue, who absolute her life is you know in in real tatters i guess in in her words and then she has to pick up which bits matter to her and and find a new home and so it's not about chucking out away her faith entirely it's about going okay which bits of this do i want to keep and i think that is also worthwhile because i think there's a sometimes a perception within pentecostal churches and i experience too which is like you're either in or you're out and i don't think that's an altogether healthy mindset right and i think so the, the issue i've got here is like the, i feel like when people cover the world of pentecostal christianity there's like two streams right and the one stream you've got a lot of stories in like mainstream news which um which are really just about the scandals you know the houston scandals the money the um sexual and financial impropriety i think all those things are really important and i'm glad they're being covered so let me be clear on that but they're always sort of told from the outside in and there's a particular lens that comes with that and i think sitting just underneath that lens is always this like look at those freaks kind of attitude. And I don't want to do that because these are still people, right? Then on the other side, inside the world, there's this real, I think Pentecostal Christianity across the board has a real issue with toxic positivity where somehow saying anything negative will always be framed as an attack by the enemy. But then there are serious issues within these communities that they do get talked about. Like they get talked about in like, Bible study groups and, you know, WhatsApp groups, like they get talked about. We all know that, but they don't. And I don't think those conversations end up within that world, get getting big enough. And that was a review. That was my view then. And it's interesting to see that reflected back at me through people 17 years later with a reflection that that like, with the exception of like shows like yours and some Instagram accounts and some Twitter accounts that has, let's just say, I don't think it's progressed enough put it that way within the church. So I guess part of my goal was like, how do I do something that can exist in the middle ground? How do I do something that's going to like, hopefully Christians will watch, right? That's, see how I go with that. And then also the people who are on the outside who just look at these people and think they're freaks, give them some tools to understand why people are in it. What does it give to them? And, and, you know, frame these people as actual people. Right. So I'm, it's a dual mission and you'll never, I'm acutely aware that I will not satisfy everybody with this, but I think what was more for me personally, what's more important is that believers watch it because it's actually kind of for their, it's actually for them that it matters most. Right. It's, it's like people on the outside, it's like, you can go on about live your life and you're fine, but survivors and people still in the world are kind of the main game for me because we are at an inflection point with Pentecostal Christianity. Uh, no one wants to admit it, but it's true. Hillsong is in free fall. No one wants to admit it, but it's true. And there are these other churches that clearly, clearly can see that there is some loose sheep that are looking to find a home. Let's put it in those terms. And the framing I use is like, you know, who will inherit the kingdom, right? Clearly that's happening in the, the city that birthed Hillsong, right? There, that is an opportunity. That is an inflection point in this faith. Whereas those new churches that inherit these people, they have an opportunity to change things. They have an opportunity to create an environment that 
doesn't have some of that toxic positivity that has. And I guess what I was seeking was an answer to the question of like, are they going to repeat the same things that went have and, and the problems are not unique to Hillsong as we all well know, but are they, are they, do they have the capacity to recognize these issues and can those issues be changed? And I don't know the answer to that question. And I may never know the answer to that question because it's not like a one answer thing. It's, it, that is something that can only be answered in everyday decisions made in church structures, everyday decisions made in, you know, small leadership structures. That is what I'm hoping. It is those minds that I'm hoping to change. It's those perspectives that I'm hoping to shift when they watch it, not to kind of impose my own view on it, but just so they can see that this is not, this film is not an attack by the enemy. You know, it's, it's a bunch of voices of people who either were or still believe, right? So these are not your enemy. These are people, right? And they're pointing out the things that can change, that, that have real world impacts on people's lives. And how do we shift that in a way that, again, doesn't attack what people believe, even though I don't believe it anymore, you know, how do we, how we move that? And that, I guess that's the gambit. That's the gambit at play there. I think your intent is good, but I think you're just giving too much credence to the ability to grow in these places <laughs> because, you know, I mean, we've been there, I'm right? i optimistic. And, yeah, and no, just... great. It's cool. And, you know, like our, our podcast, we try to take a, a stance of, of friendliness and we try to take a stance of positivity, even when we're tearing the shit down. But, you know, look, coming back to a million things that you said then, one Sorry, is that... I rambled. <laughs> no, no, it was great. But one of the things that you said was there's the people that leave that are, you know, burnt and disappointed and, and angry and hurt, and maybe they get over that and move on for sure. But then there are those that are trying to salvage something from it. And we see that in our audience. Like there are what we call progressive Christians, the people that are held on to some sort of Christianity. And then we've got hardcore atheists. And what we have in common is where we've come from. But just thinking about, you know, this this opportunity for change and growth and, and stuff like that, it's, it's awesome that you think that way. <laughs> I love how you laugh as you say it. <laughs> because, yeah, because it's just not going to happen. I mean, we were, we were shouting back in, you know, the 90s as Brian Houston is ascending to the top of the AOG, Australian Christian Churches, and just saying, this is fucked. You know, we didn't use that language, of course, we were still in it, but it's like, no, guys, this is not what this is supposed to be about. And and here we are. And then when I see a lot of these other churches, you know, these Hillsong imitators or the ones that are there ready to pick up the pieces, even when you gave the, I can't even remember the guy's name, is the, the Indian pastor from Perth, when you said to him, you know, you are possibly going to be, you know, Hillsong's uh, successor. The position that was put to me by a few people, and that's why we went to Perth in the first place, why we went to Kingdom City, was quite a few people we spoke to on background were like, if you want to look at the next one, it's not going to come from Sydney. It's coming from this place in Perth. And I, I hadn't heard of it before. And But a whole bunch of people basically said, look at Kingdom City. And all you need to do is look at the sheer number of campuses that they have around the world. And I was like, oh, wow, this is significant. And so it was put to me quite clearly that, you know, they have the makings of the next Hillsong. And they meant that in terms of growth. They didn't mean it in terms of any particular behaviour or anything like that. But I still think it's like the model, you know, whilst I know they are uncomfortable with the comparison because of what's happened with Hillsong and, and Brian in particular, I still think the comparison is valid and I'm certainly not alone in that at all. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and I'm agreeing with you. But I guess the, the thing that was interesting was he was saying, if, if you mean it in a positive way, then I'll take that on. <laughs> but if you're thinking that we're all corrupt and, you know, taking money and blah, 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 you know, and, and allegedly they're not. But I just, I just looked at it and I just thought, you're just not different enough to be doing anything new. Uh, look, I should, let me first underline the fact that I, I have, there is no evidence that Kingdom City have done anything wrong on the scale of what's gone down at Hillsong. So let me just be clear on that point. Uh, I think on a broader level, it's hard to fight. It's hard for them or anyone to argue that what um, stylistically, structurally, it's that different. I mean, you could certainly argue that maybe their governance structures are, are different and that may well be true. They didn't um, expand on that when asked, so I can only go off what is presented to me. And certainly when we were there, they were, I mean, there's two things. One, they were absolutely lovely people, but at the same time, when we were filming, there was a PR person following us all the time. They let us film everything in the service except the offering. Uh, they said, turn the cameras off during the offering. And the PR person initially threatened 
to ha- run a ca- run their own camera on our interview, which in the end they didn't do. I don't know why. It was like, I, I think, you know, there's two sort of interpretations of that. One, which is I think it exposes how nervous they are. Another interpretation is that they just don't trust any media and I could have been anybody and they wouldn't have, and they would have done the same. I don't know. I kind of don't care, to be honest with you. Like, I, I, we didn't include the part about them turning off the cameras in, in the film because I knew I would, I have no problem saying it in interviews. Look, I don't know. They're in an interesting position. They are in the, there are an ascendancy. They were lovely, but at the same time, it doesn't sort of change the fundamental questions we're asking, which is about insatiable growth. What cost does that come at? And I think that that's not a thing for me to kind of dictate to them whether they're doing well or not. It's a question for them to consider. I don't make these things to judge. I re- and I think it, it comes, like, I hope, hope it comes across that I'm not making a thing to judge, but they are, there are questions that are out there and they're not for me to answer. It's for them to consider. I, I do think that it's a really fair representation, Mark. I mean, it's, I think it's something the Christians could, could watch. And not be offended. I mean, I mean, the the greatest risk they have is that it'll be on SBS and they may see a penis and vagina before or after it. And you know, we're it's... at seven thirty, so I can guarantee you won't see genitals beforehand. Maybe afterwards, but who knows what happens? So, Christians, if you're listening, um, switch off straight away just yeah. when the credits come on. <laughs> Otherwise, there could be a little bit of peen on the on the. But it'd be an Italian penis. Yeah, you could also. Watch, I, I highly recommend you watch it on streaming, so you don't. You're guaranteed of no of, of no pain. I don't know. I think the devil could slot something in there quite easily. He's sneaky that way. I, I, he's sneaky that way. I think it's fair. Like I really do. And I've still got Christians in my family, very hardcore fundamentalist Christians in my family, who I watched it and thought about them while I was watching it, thinking, I think these guys could watch this without actually being offended. There's nothing that – I think you're quite objective. So well done in, in getting across that way because I do think that – if Troy or I made it, as as we <laughs> said before, we wouldn't have been as balanced. Well, I think this is the thing. Like, I have a, a few, there's a few people I know who are still in the, the Pentecostal world who kind of, I put it in front of early. And I think the, the reigning response, I think people, ex, I think people expected it to be more scathing than it is. And that's fine. I also think it's worth pointing out that it comes out at a time where there is kind of a glut in my mind, a glut of particularly Hillsong-based content. So obviously there's that US series, Secrets of Hillsong, Channel 7, Tom did a thing for for Spotlight. There's a lot of, and I think the Batuta Advocate apparently have got a thing out about them as well. There's a lot. There's just a lot of stuff that's happening, right? And we, we didn't know that when we were filming, but now we kind of, it became clear towards the end. I was like, okay, well, I used to work, many years ago, I used to work for Andrew Denson and uh, he had, used to have this saying, and it's like, just be aggressively you. And it's naff, and I've told him that it's naff, but it's amazing as a piece of life advice. Like, what is the most aggressively us way of approaching the situation? And it's, it's personal, it's emotional, it's as upfront and fair as possible with a recognition that it won't be scathing enough for some and it won't be glowing enough for others and then somehow we'll get caught in the crossfire and that's that. That's the job. Uh, and I think that's sort of what I've had to make my peace with. Troy, you know what I've been loving more and more lately is the variety of the HelloFresh meals that have been coming my way. Yeah, well, mate, I've told you before that my family really enjoys using HelloFresh because it just makes things really easy. And there's no more scouring the grocery store for that one ingredient to complete your recipe. HelloFresh takes away all that hassle and delivers fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients so you have exactly what you need to cut down on waste. Not only that, you can get the variety For fussy eaters, pescatarians, vegetarians, those people that are fitness freaks, you can get all those meals that suit and cater to their needs. So go to hellofresh.com slash teenage16 and use code teenage16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Go to hellofresh.com slash teenage16 and use the code teenage16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Hello Fresh, America's number one meal kit. Hey, I'm Rachel. A few years ago, I stepped away from my religious background. I had a lot of anger and a lot to say about evangelicalism and all the shitty parts of it. So I started a podcast to work through it and to feel less alone. A year into it, I asked my cousin-in-law to join the journey. And I said yes. 
I'm Molly, co-host to the show. Turns out we had a lot more in common than just being in the same family. We were both raised in evangelical house churches in the 90s and 2000s. Talk about culty. We were homeschooled, culty, and we both left religion behind about eight years ago. So now we get together every other week and talk about the nitty gritty that happens when you leave religion. Everything from how to set healthy boundaries with religious family members, theology, hell, heaven, Paul, and how to recognize and heal from religious trauma. This podcast is our healing process, and we're hopeful that sharing our stories, other people's stories, and what we learn along the way may help others heal too. Religion leaves a mark on everyone it touches. Sometimes that mark isn't always positive. Cheers to Leaving is the perfect podcast for anyone who's questioning their faith or looking to connect with others who have been there. You can find our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. So grab a drink and join us as we say, cheers to leaving. Like all good podcasts, we've got merch. Yes, we do. We've got t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, and all kinds of great exvangelical and I was a teenage fundamentalist branded gear. I don't know about you, Brian, but I wear mine proudly. I do wear mine proudly. And to get it, I went to redbubble.com and searched for Teenage Fundy. That's redbubble.com and search for Teenage Fundy. Or see the link tree URL in the show notes. All proceeds go towards building and promoting the podcast. Hashtag fucking blessed. <laughs> I think what I'm what I'm most kind of curious about is I guess kind of the me part, because I don't normally put me out there. In that, in that way, like I'm, I'm out there, like I make a lot of stuff, but I don't put my story out there and I don't know, I don't know how people are reacting to or will react to that. Well, I'm, I'm really glad that you spoke about you because I want to come back to you right now <laughs> and because this is, I was a teenage fundamentalist, right? And so we, we want to know a few things about you and specifically two, two things in the doco, you said Your household wasn't the happiest place on earth, Mm. but you felt loved at church. And then later on, you said that you never felt like you connected to God when growing up there. So there's a tension there. So Mm. obviously something was being met, but you, you know, you, you talk about being the imposter. Talk about that. Very good pickup because there's a distinction and I, and I, and I cap it off at the end, which is that churches are people. They represent the best and the worst of us. So when I was a teenager, I, I sort of pseudo adopted into this church and a whole bunch of families there. Like I would literally stay over at their houses on weekends and stuff like that. And it was lovely. You know, my family was not in a great shape at the time. And that church family just kind of absorbed me. And I would just bounce from different church family to different church family. I'd spend entire weekends away from my house. They were expressing the best of what Christianity can be. Just enormous generosity, enormous warmth and acceptance and really unconditional. Unconditional is the word. Uh, and it really was unconditional. I, I could have gone off and got a face tattoo and they would have been fine with it. Not my vibe. I, you know, don't, don't mess with a moneymaker. I think they, you know, that what's the saying about like faith through act, faith without actions? Faith without works is dead, brother. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, you were a youth pastor. Uh, <laughs> they were that. They were like a really wonderful expression of the best of that world. But I think what I couldn't escape in time was the fact that you could feel love. Well, what at the time I felt like was God's love filtered through people. But then any attempt to get that direct connection that Pentecostal Christianity so thrives on that, you know, ride the, the roller coaster of emotion with the music. Anytime that I tried for that and you could look around and there's people falling around speaking in tongues and da 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 da. I was like, n- never felt it, never felt it. And I, you know, I say in the film, like there's basically, there's two, there's two explanations for that. One, which is everyone else is lying and they're faking it too. Or there is a God and he has very specifically gone, yeah, that kid in the third row specifically, fuck him. And that is worse. Okay, Mark, so I'm going to throw a third one at you, which is what sociologists call absorption. We just had Ross and Carrie on our show recently, and absorption is definitely something, it's a psychological slash sociological term that they're using to talk about people that are more more an openness to this sort of spiritual experience, that there's something about them 
there's something about their psychology that lends them towards being able to engage this. So the people that aren't falling down at the Benny Hinn conference. Oh, there's a name I haven't heard in a while. Ooh, that's a deep cut. You'll be knocking out some Joyce Meyer next. Jesus. So the people like Brian who goes to the Toronto Blessing meetings and nothing happens, but then you've got people like me that are falling down, rolling around, simulating giving birth. The whole bit is going on. And this apparently is this term called absorption. And so that's a third explanation for you, that it's that actually it's a there's an openness, there's a a bias towards being able to experience this that some people have and some people don't. The irony is... I cry at the drop of a fucking hat. Like, you send me to a Pixar movie and I'm a mess. Like, it's not like I'm this hardened soul that is incapable of feeling shit, particularly after since I had kids. My God, I just cry at everything. So it's like, I think maybe my expectate, like my expectations were, well, I mean, you look around and you see what people are doing. So your expectations are quite significant. And I think I never quite got over that. And I think, you know, uh, I still... I think I still feel slightly guilty, to be honest with you, because it's like I was the, on the I was on the recipient of a lot of really genuine human love, and then I just sort of disappeared quite quickly at a certain point, and I've sort of had to go back bit by bit, and it was also linked up to my school because I went to a Christian school, and so the kids from the Christian school ended up in the youth group, and I sort of ended up following over, and so it sort of now as I stare down the barrel of nearly turning forty in a couple of, in a couple of years, uh, I'm like. I should probably not have thrown the baby out with the bathwater, which is kind of what I feel like I did. I just fully just went, I'm out. Uh, and I do rem- I actually do remember going to a party a couple, like a year or so afterwards. And I remember I was there with a whole bunch of like churchy people and they were like, hey, where have you been? And I'm like, ah, I just don't feel it. And I, I'm not sure it's real. And you, <laughs> you could have heard a pin drop that they it wasn't that they were like judging or anything like that they just didn't know what to say they just like like they i think the the there's a perception that somehow they were like oh it's terrible it's, how bad is it that he's left they were just like gormless like what they didn't know how to process the thing i was putting in front of them and i was like okay I think we're done here. And you sort of back away slowly into a hedge. It was like, okay. And I think that was actually in a weird kind of way, the nail in the coffin. Cause it's like, it's not only can I not feel this. I also cannot communicate to them that I'm not feeling this. I'm out. And I think the, and later on years later, I did a, um, a story during the same sex marriage plebiscite for the feed, which was a show I used to do on SBS. And I could see, you know how you have like this lingering Facebook you know, um, connections from like the beginning days of Facebook that you don't realize are there. And I'd logged on and I could see them arguing about same-sex marriage and saying some horrendous things. And I was like, I'm really done with these people now. Like not all of them, obviously. Actually, you know, a lot of them were super progressive actually on, on that issue. I mean, the bar for super progressive is like, we'll vote yes to same-sex marriage. It's not a low bar. It's not, a, I don't think it's a particularly high bar, but there were some people there that were saying some really retrograde stuff. And I was like, oh, dude. Nah, this is too hard. Before you just walked away or quiet quit, as you said, Mark, it sounds like you were skating between two worlds. You had a girlfriend who was outside of the church Mm. and... That'll do it, though. That'll do it. Yeah. It it could all just come back to this. He just wanted to sin. I mean, that's that's what they say. (laughs) Well, her name was also Jezebel, so... uh, It's funny, I did... My, well, she's my girlfriend then. She's my wife now. But we did joke a lot at the time because I went. We went to so many weddings, right? And she's from a completely non-church background, so she's just like this whole thing's weird. And we went to like two or three weddings when we would have been like 23, 20, 24. Actually, we got married at twenty four, so we're not a good example. But we got went to a few weddings. I remember one of them. There was a lot of like the classic, uh, the wife will obey and submit sort of territory and I remember in one of them she squeezed my hand so hard I'm like I remember looking over at her going breathe breathe (laughs) it'll be fine uh that marriage did not last incidentally the the, because um, she wouldn't obey well that yeah I mean I shouldn't it's I shouldn't talk about other people's marriages but I I I will say that um that's all right our our Christian marriages didn't last either it's all good oh didn't they oh no no. you will (laughs) yeah so actually interestingly the one party that marriage I he was actually the first person I told we were making this film he lives uh, over in London 
and I saw him over summer when just after we'd finished filming that that burnt out interview. And I said to him, and he was he was out here, and I was like, if I was to make a film on Pentecostal Christianity, and he just took this like sharp intake of breath because he's out of the world now. He's like, what are you doing, and why are you doing it? <laughs> I was like, well, I just want to see if there's a way we can do it and make it kind of look like the world we knew when we were kids, but but also like be fair about the issues today. And he's like, I don't think it's doable. I don't think it's like, I think it's very dangerous. And I was like, why? <laughs> so I actually need to send him a copy because he lives over in London. It's not over there at the moment yet. The plan, we'd like to get it everywhere around the world, but um, it, at the moment it's only available in Australia. He can just get a VPN yeah, and just stream it. From, he's probably going to do. Um, <laughs> so why wouldn't you? But you were you were lying to your wife, which this talks about in the documentary about where you were going yeah. on a Sunday. Yeah. And this reminds me when I was this. I, I'm still in my probably my early thirties at this stage, going to work on a Monday, and people go, "Oh, how was your weekend?" It's like, "Oh yeah, what you do yesterday." being Sunday and I was like oh I hung out with friends because I wasn't lying I hung out with friends but I was at church and I was just so embarrassed yeah. to tell anyone I was yeah. so embarrassed and oh, yeah. and and again even now you know we've got this podcast it's, it's reasonably successful people listen to it they want to talk to me about it and I'm embarrassed about the fact that I was a fundamentalist Christian mm. in my late teens and through my twenties, like that was embarrassing. I was certainly... whereas I was wearing just Jesus on my T-shirt and going to it work was. and and witnessing. Part of me really wants to meet um, Christian Troy. Like, I, like part of me just wants to see how different you are as people. Well, it, interestingly enough, the ABC did a a doco, a, like it was a youth affairs program in the nineties. So somewhere in their vaults, there is actually this story of me being, you know, right into the AOG and all that kind of stuff. And it's embarrassing. Oh, so now there's hell. a t-shirt slogan right into the AOG. It'd be like vintage, you know, I reckon I could probably find it. If you find me the, if you, if you send me the name, I reckon I could probably make an inquiry and find it. I still, I still have an ABC email address and an SBS email address. Cause I work for both. I have to I have to try and remember the name of the doctor. Yeah, but I showed I showed the footage, right? Because I had the raw footage and I showed that to my my now wife. And she was watching and Brian, you were in it as well, because it was a street oh, team prayer meeting. Oh. And my wife was watching it and she just went, nah, turn it off. Turn it <laughs> off. Like, no shit. She wasn't even joking. She was just like, turn it off, turn it off. It was too much. Uh, Christian Troy scared the fuck out of me. Like, I used to think, when is he just going to pounce on somebody and try and get them to believe? Because you could be out and he had to tell people about Jesus. He was so serious about this shit that people were going to hell. He had to save them from going to hell. Whereas I was like, I don't think I believe in hell. Well, they massively de-emphasize hell these days. That actually, they, one of the things that I will say has, I think has significantly changed since the nineties to now is a real de-emphasis on hell and devil and Satan, the enemy, whatever you want to call it. I would credit Houston and Hillsong for a bit of that because they, they turned the tables and made it a lot more like aspire to, aspire to prosperity, aspire to wealth, aspire to live your best, you know, live your best life. I don't think they're alone in it, but I think they're a significant force for the de-emphasis of like the ugly parts that were, I think, still quite prevalent in the 90s. And and it was more than that, though. It was actually a conscious decision because I heard Brian speak on this even in the 90s, in the late 90s, saying that they were stopping sort of spiritual gifts and tongues, interpretation, all that in the service, and that moved into the home groups. And yeah. so I think in the home groups, they're still quite penty and wacky, but in public, it's, you know, canned lighting, ARIA award-winning music. Grammy award-winning music. Thank you. I mean... And no shortage. I, I think you're bang on. And actually, it's the stuff that we had. Like we had whatever the equi the then equivalent of connect groups were. We had them in our house growing up. And I just I remember me and my brother like sitting in the other room, just like listening. We, this is when we were really young. I remember like like listening to like I remember being quite frightened of the whole situation, to be honest with you. Because if, if you don't know what it is, it actually is quite alarming. And then if you do know what it is, it's still alarming. My memories of it are very scattered, to be honest, uh, as as they often are with childhood. There was a lot more fire and brimstone in the 90s than there is now. It was weird. It was weird. The whole thing, it was weird and uncomfortable. Yeah. 
definitely, definitely weird. The hell thing was big. Like it was, it was really big. Well, we were in there, that's for sure, because there was. I, I think there wouldn't have been a service that went by that didn't get weaved in somehow, because it was very fear based. And then you would have your altar calls that said, "Come up if you don't want to burn." So it was. Maybe that was a Melbourne thing. Maybe Sydney maybe. people are just too shallow. <laughs> all right, mate. All right, back it up. Oh uh, no, that's all right. Bear with me while I look at it out at our beautiful harbour. Oh, hold on. I'll just get a nice coffee. Um. <laughs> whatever. Whatever happened Whatever happened to Brian? He got lost in one of your many alleyways. <laughs> I've run out of Melbourne gear. This is the thing about Melbourne-Sydney rivalry. No one can really commit to it because Melbourne is genuinely a lovely place. And I, and I take any excuse to come to Melbourne. And, and I go to Sydney a bit. So, yeah, it's, I, I actually like Sydney. But I love the rivalry. Yeah, it's funny. I tried to explain it to somebody overseas the other day and they were just like, but you both like, this is an American, but you both like each place. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like, so why is there this thing? I was like, it's just an Australian thing. We just do it. We had to explain this to guests recently from the States that we take the piss out of each other. Mm. And because I think sometimes our US audience might think, oh, do these guys actually like each other? Yes, we do. And that's why we take the piss out of each other. Then you have to explain the phrase, take the piss out of each other? No. Well, actually, yes. Funny enough, we did. Yeah. Yeah. And she was saying, she was saying, I'm going to go take a piss. And it's like, (laughs) no, not take a piss, take the piss. Take a piss means what you think it does. Yeah. Talking to a bunch of Americans, I I, had to, I was saying something. Actually, no, I was talking to Canadians. I was like, look, I don't want to blow smoke up your ass, but, and I went on and said lovely things about the team. And then they all just turned around to me. So I got everything except that one part. You're doing what to my ass? <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, that would have been very confusing if you didn't know what was going on. I mean, cathartic, but confusing. Mm, mm. So Refreshing so, even. <laughs> well, that's right. So that embarrassment. Mm. I mean, you sat with it. I'm interested in this because for me, it, as I said, it's it's there. Were you worried? I mean, you had to sit there. You had to subject yourself to your crew going, all right, uh, ask me anything. And I'm just going to, I'm going to lay it all on the table. Sounds like that was a real vulnerability. That was a brave thing for you to have to do. Do you think that people hold your penty past against you in in the media? Yes. 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 Okay. And, and let me explain. So I, I didn't, I d- wasn't not talking about it for this reason, but I gave, and I gave an interview to Compass actually a couple of years ago, which was the, one of the other things that the team at SBS were like, that was one of the other co- things they were like, oh shit, I, we didn't realize about this. Year. And I, I gave an interview to Compass and I, you know, I, I said, you know, in rough terms, what I say in the kingdom, which is like, I'm not in this world. I don't believe, but I was raised in it. And I, there were some parts of it I didn't hate. I was like, that was the gist, you know, that was the gist of it. And on Twitter, I could already see people going, he's just like Scott Morrison. He's a happy clapper. And I was like, what the fuck are you people talking about? Like, I very clearly said, I'm not in this world anymore. Like I very, like people don't get nuance or they they really don't and it, that's why I don't talk that's why I didn't talk about it until until now because I knew when it gets written up in articles and I end up doing a lot of interviews for various different things uh, that nuance of your relationship with this thing gets flattened into ex-Christian or one-time Hillsong member or whatever that kind of nonsense is and I was like I would only do this if I could do it in a way that I felt like I could explain it properly Hence, hence the kingdom to some degree. So trying to explain to people, like I was raised in this world, I'm not in it anymore. Like that, that incredibly difficult to grasp concept does not carry. And I can see like on, on Twitter and forums, people like have not got that idea and they don't like, I will live, you know, don't be wrong. Like, this is fine. I will cope, but people don't quite get it. And I, I think one of the things that was really telling for me is like, when, like, when Scott Morrison was prime minister and everyone was like, he's a Hillsong member. And I was like, no, he's not. He very clearly goes to this other bloody thing down here. He's not. But why is that so hard for people to get? Like you can still talk about him as a Pentecostal leader. You can still talk about all the things you like and don't like about that. That's fine. But this basic fact thing that people just couldn't get drove me up the wall to the point, like I'm not defending this guy. And I would, and I didn't have this conversation out loud, but like, I'm not defending this. I don't want to get into this thing of defending Scott Morrison, right? But at the same time, like, 
can we not just deal with the actual facts? Like, we know he's a Pentecostal, we know that, but he doesn't go to Hillsong. He went to a conference. They all go to the bloody conferences. He goes to this other one. It it it, it hit me like a ton of bricks how incapable it seemed like large chunks of the public were of understanding the basic facts of that. And it drove me up the wall because it occurred, like, this is the impact, I guess, of Hillsong is it flattens. It becomes the story. It becomes the entirety of the story. And it's not, and it never has been. But because of its scale and because of how big it is and, and, and how uh, it's like scandal is moth to a flame at the moment. I, so that, and I was like, I just don't, I'm a, a, like hyper aware of people just like not getting it. So it drives me up the wall that people can't understand that there's actually like a, a kingdom. There is a, there is an ecosystem, right? And I think part of this was trying to articulate, like that's why there's that big chunk in there explaining that, you know, it's the Evans family that drive, you know, and, and, and then you get, you know, you get planet shakers and you get C3 and you get like, I was like, there's a history here. This didn't come from nowhere. Yeah, I, I loved that you did that, by the way, because, and, and that another thing that you probably didn't realise is in there is there's actual old footage of Lloyd Longfield, who is the pastor of the Revival Centre, which is where I got seriously messed up. I, and I said this to Tom when he was doing, you know, building out what he was building out. I said, oh, don't forget to mention the history. Don't forget to mention the connection to all this, you know, broader Pentecostalism. But I guess for a, a lot of journos there's no room there's no time and i don't mean that in a pejorative sense i mean genuinely they've got x amount of minutes and so they're just going to tell those stories even that bit like there's a whole like you could do a whole family tree and i i think we we sort of experimented with it and i think one of my rules our, our rules with storytelling is like you only ever give the audiences enough information to understand what's happening in the moment but there's like the completest part of me that was like really wanted to get out butcher's paper and be like all right so this person connects to this, but like, you know, this, the Evans here is connected to the Evans there. And, you know, this church is connected to that church. And this is a, this is a dynasty, right? There are dynasties in this. Okay. And, you know, over on the, on the West, you've got the Var- Varagesis family and his, his thing. He's not a dynasty, but he's kind of building one, I guess. You forgot to mention the Molyneux in the West. Yeah, as well, by yeah, the way. exactly. And so there's this whole thing you could do. And then it was just like, you could do it but it's not meaningful. Like, unless you, unless you, it's meaningful to you guys, but like in terms of what you're watching in front of you at that exact moment, it doesn't help you understand. The Evans's I think was important because when we knew we were going to Planet Shakers and Planet Shakers is, uh, you know, one of the Evans's kids. So I think that was worthwhile, but I think it was also just important to kind of acknowledge, like, there's no question the Houston's changed the story, like massively, not just in Australia, but they changed the world, Right. But it wasn't like it came from nowhere. And there was, you know, there was something happening beforehand. And it's a lot of those churches that are now, they, I mean, you know, Planet Shakers and things like that, C3, you know, every, again, this is, everyone will be uncomfortable with this idea, but they are the ones that are kind of inheriting a lot of these, you know, people that no longer, for whatever reason, want to go to Hillsong. Now, I, we know that. I'm related to some of those people. So, we can see that that's happening. And some of those churches that are kind of lived to some extent in Hillsong's shadow are now kind of inheriting a lot of those lost sheep for lack of a better term. So I think there is a relationship there that people kind of need to, un- well, do they need to understand? I think in the context of the film, it's, it's useful to understand that it doesn't come out of nowhere. And it's not just the story of one church. You can visit our um, nepotism episode <laughs> we did, and we we connected a lot of those dots around some of those famous families in Australia. Yeah, they're, they're Christian nepo babies. Hey, I want to come back to asking you though about this embarrassment. So mm. professionally, you had reasons to want to hide. What about personally? Was it just, you just don't want people thinking badly about you or you don't want people thinking that you are from this wacky background? Because my wife's not really from the world and and because I left kind of at the beginning of our relationship, what actually has happened over the last 17 years is like every once in a while, I'll mention something and she'll be like, that's weird. (laughs) I actually think the bigger issue is with my family because certain members of my family are still very much in that world. And I sort of delicately dance around it with them. They know that I'm very much not in it and I've like got a hard line on, on on not being in it. But I'm also trying to walk a line where, and no one else in my, like my kids, my wife, none of us are, we're not churchy people. 
but I, I'm in this zone of like, how do we, how do we like still make those family members feel like they're part of the family and not like get annoyed when they say things that we massively disagree with. And I struggle with that sometimes, like when everything good happens and that good thing happened because they prayed about it. I was like, not because of, you know, all the other reasons why something good might've happened. I was like, there's a little part of me is just like, come on. And then I just bite my tongue. And then I encourage everyone else to bite their tongue. I don't, I mean, I don't like conflict, especially. Actually, that's a lie. I love conflict, but I don't really like doing it for no reason. And I think, uh, I think I don't have a hard philosophical take on how to deal with the differences of opinions. Look, my generalized attitude to any faith, any faith, doesn't have to be Christianity, doesn't have to be Pentecostal Christianity, is if this is a thing that helps you make sense of the world, if this is a thing that helps you step through the world with clarity and you don't hurt other people while doing it, you do you. Like that is my attitude to most faiths, right? If you can, if this is a thing that helps you move through the world and, and, and makes it all make sense, great, provided you don't hurt other people. Now, as we all know, there has been some very significant ongoing and historical ways in which Pentecostal Christianity has hurt people right? We know that. But at the, at the end of the day, it's like, I'm still trying to like, not, I'm still trying to create a space where I think both of these things are, can coexist. And that's because deep down I'm Pollyanna. Like deep down, I think, I think, uh, I think we can attack people. I think we can attack the parts of this thing that aren't working and still not leave people without faith. I don't know why I think that's doable. That was one of the things that you said in the documentary. You said the insatiable growth of Pentecostalism has left far too many casualties. And that's a really strong statement, casualties. Well, I mean, people have been, I mean, what I, what we show in the film is, is clearly the tip of an iceberg. I think it's a, it's a hand, it's a, a few key cases that illuminate the whole, like that's all you can ever do you know, with a, with a film like this, you can show a handful of stories that kind of illuminate what's happening in the broader picture, both good and bad. And we all know, and you will know better than most people that the casualties are significant people that have been moved to far darker places than even what we show in the film, right? Some people who aren't with us anymore. So I think anybody that tries to say there isn't or hasn't been a problem is lying to themselves, right? At the same time, anybody that says it's the entirety of the world and there's and there's no possibility for redemption within it, I'm not sure that's provable either. So I think there is a there is a moment that is upon them. I was gonna say upon us, it's not really upon us, it's upon them. There is a moment where hope where they can hopefully look at their world and go, what can change here? Now I don't know what the answer to that is because I don't operate in their world anymore, but I do know an answer is required. Now, some might argue that they've already got the answer and many churches are implementing it. That's great, but nobody showed us or would talk about it. So that's on them. And maybe I don't need to know, but they need to know. The people that rock up every weekend, they need to know. They need to know what the problem is and how to fix it. And don't you think it's cyclic though? I mean, we're, we're a little bit older than you. Like, you know, we're 10, 12 years older than you. And we saw all this happen in America in the 80s with Jim and Tammy Baker and Jimmy Swaggart. Mm. There was all this high profile celebrity Christianity. And then it, it all came crashing down and everyone said, oh, it's, it's different now. And then rose Kenneth Copeland and, you know, sorry to trigger you again, but Benny Hinn and all these kind of people. And now it's, it happens to be Australian and it's Brian Houston and it's Phil Pringle and it's all these other people. But isn't it the same? Isn't it just the next generation learning the same lessons again, because the system is the same? Look, maybe. And that, that, that is a, that is an uncomfortable reality that, that, that may be proven over and over again. I will say actually one of the very first books I ever read as a teenager was, um, Tammy Faye Baker and Jim, ba Jim Baker's autobiography, which from memory is just called, I was wrong, which is a great title. And I remember it cause I was like, it felt acceptable to read a, I don't know why a 14 year old, it felt acceptable to read Jimmy Baker's autobiography because there's stuff in there that like, mm, probably not like 14 year old Christian appropriate. But anyway, look, you were, just to come back to the premise of your question, you may well be right. It may not be a solvable situation. 
if that's the case, it won't up. It won't be up to me to make that call, you know. And I think this is the, I guess the, the cop outy part about being a journalist and a documentary maker is that you can present and arrange and curate these stories. And I should so say it's not obviously me doing it alone. Like Elise is, you know, the writer and director, and there's a team that's not just me, like entirely calling the shots. But you can present it. But I think whenever you make a film like this or anything, like, you know, stuff the British style has the same sort of issue. I'm starting a conversation that the audience have to finish. It's an, I, I can't present the answer to it. And I think what my hope is that when, and this is also probably true of you guys as well, right? You're creating an environment where ideas and experiences can be given voice to that perhaps have happened behind closed doors, perhaps happened in small conversations. And now thousands and thousands of people can hear it and go, oh my God, that was me. They can realize that they're not alone. It wasn't something that happened to them in isolation. And I think the community that comes out of that's really powerful. But then the next step after that is when people that are still in it have an opportunity to go, well, is this fixable? And that's on them. It's on them. You know, like it's, it's really on them to decide, you know, they're all like really proud of the communities that they're building and that's great. But I guess the question is what are the aspects within this that still need work? I mean, one of the, one of the people who's in the film, who's quite high up in one of the, the churches, <laughs> you know, when we weren't filming, he just said to me, it's like, it was very clear to me that he didn't love, he didn't love the fact we were filming and even though he'd sort of agreed to it, but he was like, he said to me off camera, one of the people, he's like, we don't need people from the outside to show what's wrong. Christians are good enough at doing that amongst themselves. And I was like, if you think that you should say that, <laughs> like, if that's how you feel, you should share that because that will cut through in a way that so much more than it will if I say it, which of course didn't happen, but you know, yeah, it, I, I struggle with, I think it comes back to that toxic positivity thing I was saying before. Like there's a real not knowing how to communicate the things that are wrong within the community or having accountability or governance structures that allow for it. Or maybe some of them do, some of them don't. I don't want to tar everybody with a Hillsong you know, shaded brush. Maybe some of them are better than others. Yeah, like I, I think I don't know what the answers are, but I do think that answers are required. It's like an abusive family. You know, you can talk inside, but you can't talk outside. And when people start from the outside to speak about you, well, then you go into defense mode and it becomes, you know, perceived as an attack. And I mean, that's the same sort of thing. If you think about it, that's Richard Nixon's administration as well. <laughs> it was it was toxic and everything that was seen as, hey, there's something wrong here was seen as an attack. And mm. it, it, this is nothing new. About paranoia, totally. This is nothing new. But I think Christianity um, now, or well, particularly fundamentalist Christianity, the the bit where I have far less hope than you, Mark, is that it's become so incredibly, it's that dominionism. Like it's not a passive Christianity. It's one that has to take over. It's one that has to be... Cross over to take over, brother. Remember? That's, that's right. What <laughs> Kit Kennedy said to us, cross over to take over. And, and that's that's a really scary thing. And, and you've certainly seen the rise of that in the States, but you've most certainly seen it here and it's becoming more and more prominent. So I think that's the tricky bit is the lack of insight with a group doing that, that believes that the only way the world can be a better place is by them having dominion over it because Christ lives in them. I think that's a, that's a frightening thought for me. I'd like to have a more positive take on it. And I know that there's some fantastic Christians out there and there's some great, great people who we love and adore and many of our listeners as well, who uh, really, you know, I, I, I'm not offended by them. I'm not offended by the way they express their faith, but it's that extremism that mm. I think we're seeing on the rise, which does really frighten me because that takes all the airtime. It does. There's a line in there where I say like, you know, churches are people. And in, in some sense, it's a bit pat, but they do express the best and the worst of us. Uh, when those people are doing something where they're you know they're enacting and the best of what they you know believe was laid out for them in a 2000 year old book then 
that often results in some really lovely relationships and really powerful, you know, positive experiences for people. Uh, and then the inverse is completely true as well. I think one way or the other, it people created the problem and people are going to have to solve it, which is like, the, as I say it, I realize it's the most like inane possible thing I can say, but it's also the, the, the truth. And I think the more people get caught up in throwing it up to the heavens to solve, the less likely things are going to get solved. That's just my view. Maybe if I felt God, I would feel differently. But I think it's not a thing you can ignore. And I think there is a there is a willingness, at least in some corners of the Christian world, to if you put your head in the sand, the problems will go away. And I and I'm not and I and again I should give credit, some of the churches have made some significant changes and that's great. And I think it's worth noting. Um but I the, the the impression I get from talking to people is there's still work to be done. What's next? What's next for for Mark Fennell? And you know, you've done this doco. Obviously, there's a, a bit of media that you'll be doing around this for a little while, and we may even see a bit of a groundswell because I do think it has taken a a different take on the whole Hillsong thing because Hillsong certainly is part of that documentary and a significant part, but you take a broader perspective. So I think you're going to see a little bit come out of it. But what's next? Well, uh, I'd like to say my mum still talks to me. That'll be great. She hasn't watched it yet, so that'll be interesting. I think she'll get it. I think for me personally, I'm, I've got another the three-part series coming out later in the year that is I was about to say it has nothing to do with religion. And then I realized that was actually a lie. Uh, it is a heist movie. It's a three-part heist movie, but that does involve the Catholic church at some very crucial point. You know, there's no issues there, obviously, uh, with the Catholic church. So I'm sure that'll be fine. For me personally, then a big part of next the rest of the year, I'm out over the world filming season two of Stuff the British Doll. So I'm basically taking on the Pentecostal church, the Catholic church, and the British empire. So let's see if I survive the next year. Yeah, what could go wrong? I yeah. mean, a uh, way to start small. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Mark, thank you so much for being part of our show. It's really great to have someone with your profile telling the story. It's like we said to Tom, Tom Tilly, when he released his book, we said, You're telling our story. And watching that doco, like I said, I just resonated with you so many times in that doco, just going, Oh, you know, he gets it, he knows it. So, thanks so much for doing what you do and what you've done. I also want to, I guess, point out to people that The Kingdom is now available on SBS On Demand. For our international listeners, it's not quite available yet, but we're going to throw the link to the international version once it's released. We'll put that in our show notes. So keep checking back if you want to check out Mark's doco, The Kingdom. Yeah, it's a crack up. Definitely watch it, people. We look forward to you starting your own mega church soon, Mark. I mean, that's obviously you've gone around, you've got all the tips, you've got tips from the States, from Australia. Surely you've got the inside scoop to pick up all those sheep that are wandering aimlessly. Thank you so much. And we'd love to get you back on um, and, and chat because I think there's so many great stories that you will tell. And also, as you now embark on a journey of probably trauma therapy, mm. a lot more stuff will come to the fore for you and a lot more stuff will come out. Yes, I suspect so. Thanks, boys. Thanks, Mark. Love your work. If you'd like to connect with the I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist podcast, then please see the links in our link tree in the show notes. We invite you to pop across to our very vibrant listener community on Facebook, which is a private group, and we're also on Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit. Also, a huge thank you to Lucy, who manages our social strategy, and to Kerry and Bree, who manage our Facebook listener group. All of our episodes are transcribed to increase accessibility, and the I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and pretty much wherever you get your podcasts. It's produced and hosted by Brian McDowell and Troy Waller, with all sound production and editing done by Troy Waller. You can find all these links in our link tree in the show notes.